Dear brothers and sisters, I would like to welcome you to attend our virtual service. I want to share a verse with you. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. According to this verse, the old me with my old and bad character has been crucified with Christ. It is dead, hung with Jesus on the cross. Then who is living in this body is Jesus. Jesus has taken over my body. If Jesus is truly living in me, then people should be able to see it. They will see me behaving and living like Jesus. Is that how you live? Can people see Jesus in you? This Christ-likeness can't be achieved in a short time. It is a lifelong process. We should always consciously and intentionally seek to live like Jesus. I will lead us to say the opening prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for saving us. We realize that we are no longer to live for ourselves, but for you. Lord, we live in a sinful world. We are exposed to evil and temptations every day. Please strengthen us through the Holy Spirit and your word so that we can keep ourselves holy for you. Lord, please keep on working in us to will and to act in accordance with your will. We believe that as we obey your will and your commands, we will receive your true and holy blessings. May we continue in your word and your ways which lead to eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We ask them Lin to lead us to sing two songs to worship the Lord. The 24 elders and the four living creatures in heaven never stop worshiping. Neither should we stop worshiping our God. You hold my word in the palm of your hand, and I am yours forever. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I
Today, we have a guest speaker. He's Mr. Yap Dong Kiang, and he will speak to us about prepare the way of the Lord. Let's listen to him. Good morning. I'm Melissa Nicholas. I will be reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 20 from the New International Version. Verse 1. In the 15th year, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and Traconitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas, and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for Him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Verse 8 Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Verse 12 Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He replied, Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. Verse 16, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. 
and with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Thank you. Good morning, church. Before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. As we gather to ponder over your word, may each of us be strengthened to live a life that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the history of the world, some people were very powerful. They were known as the great. They were given the title The Great. One famous example is Alexander the Great. There are more than 100 people who are also known as the Great. But our Lord Jesus tells us that there is one person greater than all these great people. In Matthew 11, 11, Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Why was John the Baptist great? It was not because he lived a long life. He died at a relative young age. It was not because he had a very long ministry. He had a very short one, only one year of ministry. After that, he was thrown into prison and was executed two years later. John was great because he made his life count for the glory of God. And in Jesus' estimation, a life well lived for God is a great life. John's ministry is highlighted in Luke chapter 3. Let's begin with verses 1 and 2. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Trichonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Luke was a very careful writer and a very good historian. He wanted, to tell, he wanted to tell us that the story unfolding before us is deeply rooted in history. You cannot read verses 1 and 2 and miss the point of the writer. What is the point of Luke in writing verses 1 and 2? He wanted to tell us that the people he was talking about were as real as your next door neighbor. These events are not the result of his imagination. They are a real part of world history. It's like saying, during the third year of the chief ministership of Datuk Patinghi Abang Johari, the church BEM Bright Star started to use virtual platform for the church services. Notice that Luke not only mentioned Tiberius Caesar, the second emperor of Rome, he also mentioned Pontius Pilate, Herod, Lysanias, and Philip. These were all the powerful political leaders of that time in the land of Palestine. After that, Luke went on to mention the powerful religious leaders, the high priest Annas and Caiaphas. In these two verses, Luke mentioned the political masters and the religious authorities that were so influential in the life of a Palestinian Jew. Luke also gave us the time John began his ministry. It is in the 15th year of Tiberius reign. It is around AD 27 or 28. Luke also gave us the place in the wilderness around Jordan River. Notice the last part of verse 2 says, The word of God came to John. The word of God did not come to the powerful people of their time. 
The word of God did not come to the political leaders. It did not come to the powerful religious leaders. But it came to a simple man in the wilderness. Since the time of prophet Malachi, who was the last prophet of the Old Testament, there was no prophet in Israel for 400 years. God seemed to be silent for 400 years. And then, in the wilderness, the word of God came to John. Luke chapter 3, verses 3 to 6 tells us that he, John, went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight path for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. In John's time, if a king wants to visit a town, he will send messengers to inform the town people to prepare the roads for him. Similarly, John tells his listeners to make their lives ready so that the Lord can come to them. In other words, John is to prepare the people for the coming Messiah. He is making a people ready for the Lord. That is John's purpose. Preparation. What does John do? What does John do to prepare the way, to prepare the people? Verse 18 tells us the answer. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. John prepared the people by proclaiming good news to them. But a lot of what John says doesn't sound like good news. Look at what he said to the crowd who came to him to be baptized in verse 7. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Is that good news? Is that the gospel? Yes, that is the first vital part of the gospel. We can break down John's message into five parts. This five-point message is to prepare the people for the coming Messiah. Here is the good news in five points. Point number one, you are a sinner. John bluntly tells the whole crowd that they are in a rotten condition. You, brood of vipers. Vipers are poisonous snakes. It's a figurative way of describing people who are evil and will cause harm. John is saying, you are full of poisons. You are all sinners. This message is spoken almost 2,000 years ago and is still relevant for us. We can imagine John speaking to us. You are also a brood of wipers. Yes, we are all sinners. We can never appreciate the richness of our salvation. We will never appreciate the richness of God's grace until we know how much we have sinned against God. We must know that we are sinners. We are not just sinners. We are rotten sinners, rotten to the core. We cannot save ourselves. If you do not believe you are a sinner, you will never need a savior. If you have no sin, why do you need a savior? Only sinners need a savior. Only sick people need to see a doctor. Healthy people don't need the service of a doctor. First, we need to know we are desperate sinners. Point number two, judgment of sin is coming. You brood of vipers, who want you to flee from the coming wrath? How can rotten sinners flee from the wrath to come? There is judgment coming. Our sin must be judged. We are done. We are condemned. Whatever we sow, we shall also reap. We sow to our sinful nature, we will reap death. In verse 9, John is even more explicit talking about the judgment. The ex is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Judgment is coming, and it is near. If there is God, if God exists, there must be judgment. If there is no judgment, then there is no justice. 
Look around us. Evil people seem to get away with the things they do. They seem to live long and prosperous lives. They seem to enjoy the fruits of their corruption. Yes, judgment must come. If not, it seems that it pays to live a selfish, immoral and greedy lives. But judgment will surely come. God will see to it that it doesn't pay to live a godless life. Note the second part of verse 8. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Why do, why do the Jews have so much confidence in Abraham, their ancestor? It's because in Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, God speaking to Abraham said, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. The Jews believe that the descendants of Abraham will never come under the judgment of God. They think that once Abraham is their father, they are protected from the wrath of God. But John said, you cannot depend on your ancestry. Ancestry will not save you. Your family connection is not going to help you. In the business world, family connections may help you clinch a deal. Family connections may help you get a job. You may have an advantage over others because of family connections. But when you come to spiritual things, when you deal with God, family connections will not help you. Many of you, young people, are enjoying God's blessings because of your parents. Your parents have God's favor. Your parents know God personally. But do you know God personally? Or are you living on borrowed faith? You tumpang your parents' faith. Of course, when God blesses your parents with a good job, with good income, you will also be able to enjoy your parents' fruits. God blesses your parents with a good house, a good car, and good relatives. All this you also enjoy. But you enjoy them because of God's blessings on your parents. God has found favor with your parents. My question to you, young people, is this. Has God found favor with you? Have you personally believed in Him? Have you put your trust in Him? Do you know Him, my friend? If your parents were not in the picture, would you still read the Bible? Would you still pray? Would you still come to church? If your parents could not come to church, would you wanting church? On the day of judgment, it will be very sad to hear God say, I know your parents, but I don't know you. Point number three, so repent. Verse three tells us that John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. To repent means to have a change of mind, a change of heart. To repent is to turn away from sin and turn to God. John proclaims that God will forgive the people when they repent and he calls them to demonstrate the repentance through baptism in the Jordan River. Point number four, produce fruit of repentance. Verse eight tells us to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. It's not enough to say, I don't want to sin anymore. We must also say, from now onwards, I want to live a life that pleases God. True repentance, true turning away from sin will be followed by good deeds and works. What types of works or deeds does John exhort the people to do? Let's read Luke chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? 
Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He replied, Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. There are three groups of people mentioned here. The crowds in verse 10, the tax collectors in verse 12, and the soldiers in verse 14. From the crowd, Luke single out tax collectors and soldiers. Why not mention the farmers, the fishermen, the carpenters, etc.? Surely, in that crowd, there were other professions. Why are the other professions not mentioned? Luke purposely singled out the tax collectors and the soldiers from the crowd because they are the two very important institutions of a country. The government needs taxes to run the country and the soldiers to keep the people under control. Without taxes and the soldiers, the country will collapse. And because these are powerful institutions, they are open to abuse and many tax collectors have used their positions to become rich. The soldiers can also take advantage of their positions to rob others. They can just take other people's things by force. Do you notice that all the exhortations here have to do with money, possessions and power? For example, the last part of verse 14 reads, Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely be content with your pay. To the crowds, John exhorts them to share what they have with others in need. Give to others. Give. And to the more powerful people of society, the tax collectors and soldiers, John exhorts them not to take what is not theirs. Be content with what you have, what you're earning. Don't take what is not yours. Don't take our faith in God will affect the way we handle our money and our possessions. The main reason is that for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The way we handle our money and possessions will reveal the priorities of our lives. John not only preached about money and power, he also preached against adultery. In verses 19 and 20, Luke tells us that when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Herod was a ruler in Palestine. John accused Herod of committing adultery. You see, Herod paid a visit to his brother in Rome. During that visit, Herod set his eyes on a beautiful woman, his brother's wife, and he seduced her. Herod came back home, divorced his own wife, sent her out of his palace, and married his sister-in-law. John was a courageous and fearless preacher. He rebuked Herod publicly and bluntly. Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It is wrong for you to marry her. You have sinned against God. You have committed adultery. Of course, Herod was offended. He did not like what John said about marriage and divorce. So he had John arrested and thrown into prison. In these few verses, we have a glimpse of the themes of John's preaching. Money, sex, and power. Again and again in the Bible, the love of money and abuse of power and the wrong use of sexual relations are mentioned. Why? Because these three issues have caused the downfall of many Christians, including Christian leaders. Many of us will fall into sin in these three areas. These three things, money, sex, and power, pose the greatest temptation to the human heart. These three forces continue to pull at the strings of our heart all the time. We need to know how to handle these three great forces in our lives. John Piper has written a helpful book about money, sex, and power. 
You can download his book in PDF format for free from his website. I also recommend that you read the book by, John, uh, by Richard Foster. Richard Foster says, Money, sex, and power are explosive themes that can turn into demons that will bring us sorrows. The demon in money is greed. The demon in sex is lust. And the demon in power is pride. Uh, lastly, John says, point number five, the Messiah is coming, verses 15 and 16. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John is saying, don't focus on me. I'm nothing compared to Christ. I call you to repentance and baptism. What I'm doing is just a preparation. It's just a beginning to get you ready to meet the Messiah. All my preaching is to get you ready. I'm preparing the way for him. And what happens when the Messiah comes? What happens to the repentant people when he comes? Verse 16 tells us that they are baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The power of God falls on them. They have power to live the Christian life. So Jesus' coming is going to bring us blessings. This is the first coming. The second coming of Jesus will bring judgment. Verse 17, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. People are being compared to wheat and chaff. Those who have repented are the wheat. Those who have not repented are the chaff. So the Messiah is coming both to gather and to burn. Will you be gathered like the wheat into the storehouse or will you be burned like the chaff? When Jesus comes again, he will separate the wheat from the chaff. He will separate those who belong to him from those who do not belong to him. This is the gospel. There is no gospel without the message of judgment. We will never understand the depth of God's mercy unless we understand God's judgment of sin. The good news is that although we are all condemned in our sin, there is a way of escape from this condemnation. The way of escape is found in Jesus. Jesus has died on the cross so that we can escape the condemnation of our sin. And Jesus rose from the dead to make us righteous with God. Oh, how great is His mercy and love to save rotten sinners like us. What happens when you believe in Jesus? You will have a great life. Yes, a great eternal life. You will have the greatest joy of knowing God, of being united with Christ. But your life in this world might get worse. John preached against Herod's adultery and he was thrown into prison. John obeyed God. He did what was right. He preached against sin and ended up in prison. Living for God doesn't mean that you will never get into trouble. The gospel is not repent and God will make your life easy. The gospel is not repent, trust God and He will give you everything you want. The gospel is not repent, trust God, and your life will be a bed of roses. Instead, the gospel is a message sent to all condemned sinners. All are already condemned. The good news is that all of us can be saved if only we will repent. Put our trust in Jesus. Find our righteousness in Jesus Christ. Seek His face. If you have Jesus, you have all that you need for salvation. You will have the greatest possible joy no matter what troubles and trials and sufferings come your way. No matter what happens in life, in times of peace and in times of tragedy, Jesus Christ is enough for us. His grace is always sufficient for us. Has the Lord spoken to you through this message? Do you sense the need to come to Jesus to be saved? Jesus is waiting for you. If you come to Him and repent of your sins, He will save you. He will forgive your sins and change 
your life. Maybe you are walk away from the Lord and are not as close to Him as you once were. You can come home. God allows second chances. God still loves you. Come back to Jesus. Come back to Jesus. We will ask Damlin to lead us to sing the closing song, and after that, I will make the announcement. I want to call for a prayer and fast on 12 August, which is next Thursday. Join me for prayer from 8 to 9.30 p.m. on that day. Even if you can't fast due to health or other reasons, you can still join me for prayer. We need to seek the Lord for more anointing to pray for people with serious needs. Right now, we are praying for three persons who have cancer and also praying for a few people who have mind issues. There are many more people out there who have serious struggles. Only God can help them. We need to stay anointed to be able to minister to them. 
So let's seek the Lord by praying and fasting. We're glad that 29 persons attended the prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Among them are four young believers. When you're a baby, you depend on others to care for you. When you've grown older, you started to help and care for other people. How's the spiritual growth at this time? Are you still expecting others to pray for you? Or do you say, I want to reach out to others and pray for them? There's this American pastor called Bill Wilson. He lives and serves in New York. He has the big, biggest Sunday school in the world. He has 21,000 children. He was abandoned by his mother while he was 13 years old. His mother brought him to a street in New York. She said to him, wait here, I will come back. He waited there for three days. His mother never came back. Then a man saw him. He stopped his car, crossed the street to ask him if he was okay. The man made a few phone calls and five hours later, Bill was on his way to attend a Sunday school camp. And there he received Jesus. Now who was the man? He was on the way to hospital to see his son who was dying of leukemia. So my brothers and sisters, don't just think about your needs. Reach out to other people. Offer to pray for them. There might be someone who has a more serious need than you. It's impossible for pastor to call and pray for everyone. You have to rise up to assist pastor to pray for others. Two weeks ago, while waiting for Vicky to buy vegetables at the Third Mile Bazaar, I was wondering whom I could call to pray. Then I read in a WhatsApp group that my former classmate in Indonesia had come down with COVID. I called him. He's a Buddhist. I offered to pray for him. He accepted my prayer offer. And after the prayer, he told me, while you're praying for me, my body felt warm. A seed has been planted. Your prayers can touch a person. None of us can do without the prayer meeting. You definitely need someone to pray for you. If you don't need prayer support now, you will surely need it one day. Even if you don't need anyone to pray for you, you find that you need people to pray for someone who is dear or very close to you, someone who is having a serious challenge. We live in a fallen world where many challenges in life. We encounter harassment from the evil one. So we need to support one another in prayer. Some of us have been greatly helped by the prayers of brothers and sisters when we went through hard times. But you still join a prayer meeting to pray for others who are having serious difficulties? We must not forget that we are always in spiritual warfare. The devil is watching us. He will oppose us and will try to destroy the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18 For we wanted to come to you. Certainly, I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. A few months ago, an old woman walked into a rural church to talk to the pastor. The pastor took a selfie with her. Then he showed a photo to a member. The member said that that's her late mother. Spiritual warfare is very real. So how do we defend ourselves against the devil? By being vigilant and by praying. We need to guard ourselves against the tricks of the devil. If you have issues with a pastor, leader, or a member, you need to follow the principle in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. We have to be careful. Any unresolved issues can be exploited by the devil. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to 11, Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And why forgiven? If there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outweigh us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Now, unforgiveness or unresolved misunderstanding will play into the hands of the devil. Now, this is how it works out. A problem occurs. You dwell on the problem. The devil sees opportunity. He fires fiery arrows against you. 
these arrows come in the form of negative thoughts. For example, see, they are so mean, they need respect you, they don't care about you. What's the use of working with people like them? Better you leave. So you distance yourself from the church. You thought of going to another church, but you heard that it also has problems. You consider another church, but it also has problems. You get confused. You find yourself in the middle of the river, not sure whether to swim back or to swim on. Now because you're detached from the church, opportunities to serve drop drastically. You are no longer fresh and sharp. You think you're okay, but actually you are not okay. You have failed to realize that the devil has gotten you. Now I will lead us to say the closing prayer. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us. We repent of our wrong life and wrong values. We realize that we have to stand before you and give account of ourselves to you one day. Lord, we want to be faithful. We want to be steadfast in the midst of hardships and persecutions. We are your workmanship, created to do good works. Help us to serve you wholeheartedly. Help us to serve you with love, joy and faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.